With the world seemingly teetering towards chaos, as Russian shells explode within meters of a nuclear power station, as the global energy crisis simmers, as official American visits to Taiwan increase tensions with China, I was reminded of the YouTube channel The Grim Life Collective and its host Michael. Whenever he films his true crime videos, he always asserts that while the places he visits might disturb some viewers, it is crucial that we walk the history so that history will be forever preserved. Whether it be the graveyard where notorious madman Ed Gain exhumed fresh corpses, or the apartment block where Jeffrey Dahmer attempted to make sex zombies out of young boys, history must be walked. While these grim locations seem innocuous and mundane, the events that took place there played their part in changing history. We can forever be respectful to the victims that suffered, while acknowledging the extent to true human evil. At exactly 8.15am on August 6, 1945, Little Boy detonated over the city of Hiroshima, Japan. The first atomic attack to be used in warfare would kill thousands, but its consequences would be far more reaching. The world would be forever changed. To this day, many of us live in deep fear. A dark cloud hanging over every global incident, leaving us terrified of what a nuclear exchange might look like. Nick Jackson's 1984 TV movie Threads may be the most realistic and horrifying account of both the initiation and aftermath of a nuclear war. I recommend it only to those with a strong mind, and I certainly do not suggest watching it more than once. I bring up Hiroshima and the terrible events that occurred there on that day because I live within a few hours drive of the city. On a recent trip, I walked history as the Grim Life Collective would say. I crossed the bridges that form a unique pattern, so much so that the US military used them as a rough target to drop the bomb. The bridges are located near Genbaku Dome, or Atomic Dome as it's known in English. This eerie sightseeing spot with its large chunks of unmoved debris, twisted metal and scorched brick hardly seems real. It resembles a movie set, a reproduction of something none of us can really imagine. It serves as a reminder to all those that visit the city. For the locals, I am sure they mostly avoid it. Behind Genpaku Dome is a small quiet road with pleasant little hotels and apartment complexes. It is on this street that we can locate two far less popular spots than Genpaku Dome, the Peace Park, or the museum full of artifacts from that fateful day. One of them is a tiny shrine. Temples and shrines are replete in Japan. This one has one tiny little statue that is unique. At the front of the shrine, a small stone depiction of a woman with a stern expression and draped in a red cloth sits staring across the way. Below the statue on the circular pedestal where it sits, we can make out a permanent shadow etched into the stone. This shadow was caused by the nuclear blast that occurred directly above. The expression on the statue has remained unchanged to this day, staring ahead without emotion. Not much further down the road, on the corner of a street that could resemble any corner on any street in Japan, we find a sign informing us that directly above, at this exact pinpoint location, the hypocenter occurred. Hypocenter refers to the exact point where an atomic or nuclear bomb detonates. I stood there, looking up at the perfect blue sky, completely unable to fathom how it was exactly here an event that is forever scorched into the human psyche, just like the pedestal on that little statue happened. It is often in the most ordinary of places, where people walk past completely unaware, going about their day, that such events happen. No matter the tragedy, no matter the gravity, the planet keeps spinning on its axis. With seemingly one treacherous situation after another going on somewhere on planet Earth, it is important to walk history. To remember how everything can change in one infinitesimal moment, on any street corner, in any town or city, anywhere. Mad God, released on Shudder this year, is a film mostly about walking. Rather than walking history, 
Our lead character walks through the bowels of the earth. History surrounds him. There are the skeletons of giant dinosaurs, cities wasted to dust, equipment and technology of days gone by left to rust. However, rather than learning from it, he appears to be solely focused on one mission. The mission can be aided by the things around him, but he hardly seems to notice them. We, the audience, do notice them, however, such is their grotesquerie. Mad God is an animated film by Phil Tippett, a mix of stop-frame animation interspersed with the occasional actor to add a more realistic and then haunting atmosphere. Phil Tippett has a very impressive visual effects resume ranging from Star Wars to Jurassic Park, Robocop, and even Paul Verhoeven's 1997 cult classic Starship Troopers. Mad God has been in production for 30 years, a passion product he has finally brought to the big screen. Three decades of work certainly shows in the complexity of the world he has created. Each scene is full of new ideas and visual wonders, most of them horrifying, but deeply beautiful. The style of the movie certainly brings to mind the stunning music videos of American heavy metal band Tool, and the films of the experimental filmmaker Jan Svankmeyer. Stop motion can bring to life the most twisted and demented of characters and situations. While never quite attaining the creepiness of Svankmeyer's work, Mad God is a more accessible film for moviegoers unfamiliar with classic claymation effects. Mad God begins with a character known only as the Assassin, as he descends the layers of the earth in a type of bullet-shaped submarine being lowered on an impossibly long rope, clad in what looks like the combination of a World War II soldier's outfit and that of an old-fashioned diving suit. He delves deeper and deeper into a hellish world of torture and depravity. There are oddly shaped monsters living in a town that looks like it endured the hell of nuclear war centuries ago. Giant figures strapped to electric chairs that cause them to defecate with every shock. And stick men charged with moving giant monoliths into place like dominoes that crush them as they topple, much to no one's shock or attention. The monoliths evoke Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. As the mysterious assassin plunges further into the depths of hell, he gets closer and closer to his final destination and the resolution of his mysterious mission. In one sequence, in order to save time, he finds a jeep covered in the dust of time and remarkably it coughs and sputters into life. Once the engine is running, he uses the truck to drive into the depths of a dark foreboding building, which reminded me of the hell maze landscape of Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Hell and what lies within its recesses is certainly the visual language of Tippett's beautiful film. Once we reach the final resting place, a bizarre world of colourful goblins, spiders and dusty covered grand clocks and glass domes, the movie becomes a kaleidoscope of colour and sound that could almost depict the beginning of the universe, or perhaps the end. Mad God is a movie with a very straightforward and simplistic plot, a plot designed to let Tippett's imagination go wherever he chooses. While this results in a unique visual experience, the second half of the movie lost me a little. The intensity of Mad God's visual code, when dragged out of a full-length running time, was a little too much. Perhaps aesthetics and ideas such as these work better as shorts or music videos, and I will certainly remember the power of Tor's music videos over Mad God for a far longer time. That said, if you are looking for a very unique and rare experience in these days of endless superhero movies and computer-generated effects, Mad God might be the deep, dark journey into the unknown that you are looking for. Is Rebecca Hall the most talented actress working in horror right now? After her star turn in The Night House, last year's dark tale of a woman dealing with extreme grief, yet suspicion surrounding her husband's recent death and the reasons behind it, she follows that screen-dominating appearance with resurrection. The Night House showed her capacity for playing a character perching on the precipice into madness and insanity. In that movie, not her best friend, her peers or her neighbours believed in her emotional pleas for understanding. While at times being an intentionally awkward and cringe-inducing performance, Hall truly made us believe in her. Whether or not what supernatural occurrences were just in our mind or were truly happening, we emphasised with her character as she attempted to get to the bottom of her husband's life, 
and what motivated him to do what he did. The Nighthouse ended on a truly divisive note, one that split audiences, with most believing that the movie ended in a silly, unsatisfying way. In Andrew Seaman's Resurrection, Hall plays Margaret, a single mum with a daughter on the cusp of entering university. She is overly protective, perhaps a helicopter parent. She insists on constant contact via text message and phone calls. Her eyes fill with disappointment every time she comes home to find her daughter preparing to go hang out at a friend's house and play Elder Scrolls. She runs at night through the city, her long legs and skinny frame covered in sweat. Faster and faster, as if she's trying to escape something awful, something following her that she can never lose. At work, she's the boss, delivering presentations on medical breakthroughs and chaperoning interns, preparing them to go off into the world and become as successful as she is. From her accent, we know she's British, another border that separates her and her colleagues, like the dark glass cage of her office. When she gets home after her runs by the river, she sits drinking cold beer directly from the bottle, the television off, alone with her thoughts and waiting for something. Suddenly her phone lights up and we cut to heavy breathing. It soon becomes clear she's having an affair. After sex, she lays in bed with a man we haven't seen before, giving him tidbits from her past, things she hasn't told anyone before, like how she hasn't drawn in two decades. But long ago, she did it all the time. Her routine repeats, work, runs, beer, the affair. The only thing that seems to give her any sense of satisfaction are the conversations she has with her intern, a shy but seemingly strong young woman who has had trouble with men who have only used her as an object. This strikes a nerve with Margaret. One day, David Moore, hauntingly played by Tim Roth, the actor most famous for his riveting work with Quentin Tarantino in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, appears across from her at a conference. Margaret panics, initially frozen with fear and then hyperventilating. She flees the room, running all the way home, never stopping, terrifying her daughter when she bundles into her room in a daze. Who David is and what he has done to her will become apparent. The first to find out will be the intern, someone who comes with no baggage in Margaret's life, an almost stranger who she thinks has experienced something of what she has. However, upon hearing the truth about Margaret's past with David, the intern is so repulsed and terrified she simply flees, as did I wish that I could have too. It's a truly shocking monologue, expertly acted by Hall. In fact, it is the best pure ten minutes of acting brilliance that I have witnessed in a very long time. It had me glued to the screen. Resurrection proceeds to some very dark places. The fall into panic, anxiety and insanity that Margaret suffers as David retakes his place in her life reminded me of 1981's Possession. That movie of total heart-pounding craziness and depravity followed two people wrestling with their separation. The notorious subway corridor scene, the most complete and electrifying depiction of the most severe panic attack anyone could imagine, took possession into supernatural dreamlike places. Resurrection remains more grounded in reality, but still veers towards a hallucinogenic dreamlike end. The final showdown between Margaret and David is a thrilling, disturbing set piece of a woman finally breaking free of the chains that have bound her for decades. Whether this results in her finally being at peace is mostly left for the audience to decide. Aside from 1977 Suspiria, I had mostly gone unfamiliar with much of legendary Italian director Dario Argento's work. Dawn of the Dead remains one of my favourite horror masterpieces, a film which he had contributed to some degree, but one which was very much a product of George Romero. Although I had a great experience watching a midnight showing of Suspiria in the Duke of York cinema in Brighton, England over a decade ago, I had taken little interest in a lot of giallo, shunning the genre for Asian horror. Over the last few years, I've become very familiar with the work of Lucio Fulci, who I now believe to be one of the great geniuses of horror. Mario Bava's excellent Black Sabbath has become one of my favourite anthology movies. A recent rewatch of Suspiria and Deep Red compelled me to watch more of Argento's work. Opera dazzled me with its depraved and violent murder scenes. 
the young female protagonist forced to watch a madman kill by way of pins being inserted above and below her eyes. In Phenomena, or Creepers as it's also known, a young Jennifer Connolly must confront an alarming increase in her sleepwalking activity when she attends school in Switzerland. A lover and protector of insects of all shapes and sizes, her first midnight walk occurs on her very first night. After witnessing a woman fall through a window pane covered in blood, she almost perishes as she walks off a high rooftop ledge, only to miraculously survive after her nightgown gets caught on the edge and a bush breaks her fall. Not long after, she finds herself, now fully awake, in the countryside retreat of Donald Pleasance's Professor McGregor, a scientist who studies insects and also has determined a way to accurately estimate the exact time of death of corpses by way of the size of the maggots that cover the rotten flesh. We soon discover that Jennifer Connolly has a supernatural ability to be protected and almost to communicate with insects. One even begins a mating cry after sitting on her arm, out of season. Behaviour that perplexes Professor McGregor. Aside from all the bugs, the main thread of the movie sees Jennifer and the Professor attempt to locate a killer on the loose. The bugs offer up clues and lead Jennifer to find items of evidence. What follows are scenes that will make those with a phobia of creepy crawlies to cover their eyes and run to the bathroom, clutching their mouth. While there are gross-out scenes and some quite nasty incidents of violence towards the end, the whole movie plays out like a fairy tale or fable. Most striking for me was the score composed by Goblin. While I greatly prefer George Romero's original score for Dawn of the Dead, for which he used free-to-use library music, to Argento's Goblin scored re-edit, the score for Phenomena adds a bizarre, heavy metal style to the more fantastical scenes. One such track I especially found to work was the signature one that plays every time Jennifer begins one of her dazed sleepwalks. If you are prone to one of these yourself, might I suggest locking all the doors. You never know what you might encounter when you leave the safety of your bedroom.